If you eat up all your vegetables, then you can have some nice ice cream for pudding. Now, most of us will have grown up hearing those words or something pretty similar. And those who've been parents have probably said them in some shape or form. If you work hard at school, you'll get good grades in your exams and get a good job. And that principle is generally true, isn't it? For those of us that are working uh, in most organizations, if you work diligently and you're honest, then this will be rewarded with promotion to a more responsible job and you'll earn more money. I'm going to call that the principle of just compensation this morning, just for shorthand, the principle of just compensation. Doing good leads to good rewards. Doing wrong leads to bad consequences. And we find that principle in much of the Bible as well. If we do good, then God will reward us if we disobey God's commands, if we sin, then the consequences will be bad. We can find endless examples of that principle in the Bible. Look at the blessings and curses at the end of the book of Deuteronomy that Moses lays out. Um, or much of the book of Proverbs, as, as we've already referred to this verse in their service, uh, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways, Submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. But, as we know, the world we live in doesn't always work like that, does it? Bad stuff sometimes happens to good people. And I'm really pleased that the Bible contains books which address that issue and raise questions about this principle of just compensation. We thought about one of those books last year as we preached through Ecclesiastes, and we're trying to get to grips with another one of them at the moment. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the innocent suffer? And the book of Job wrestles with that question. And I say wrestles because I don't think that the book gives a simple answer to that question. I don't believe there is a simple answer, but this series gives us an opportunity to think about the question, why do the innocent suffer? If God is good, why is there so much suffering in the world? He created. We're going to ask some of those questions in our next But What If evening on the 28th of September. Please uh, be praying as we prepare for that. And please think and pray about who you could invite to that evening. Because this is an issue that, that all of us need to address, whether we're Christians or not. Why is there such suffering in the world? And we're tempted to provide simple answers to those questions, aren't we? We could say, well, suffering is always a result of human sin and disobedience. And undoubtedly, that's partly true. Suffering can often be linked directly to human wrongdoing. Wars, violence, the drunken driver who, who knocks over a pedestrian, the violent parent. These are the stories we find every day in our newspapers, aren't they? Stories of how bad things, wrongdoing, has le led to suffering. Even, even the loss of life in a great earthquake, it is within our capability to design and build apartment blocks which don't collapse in an earthquake. And it's often human greed or human corruption which leads to the great loss of life. We're beginning to see, aren't we, more and more suffering as a result of climate change. And I believe we're going to see much more in the coming years, unfortunately. And we could do something about it. Yet people elect a president who denies there's a problem. Yes, much suffering is a direct result of human sin and human wrongdoing, either our own or that of others. But that's certainly not the whole answer. Bad stuff does happen to good people, and sometimes it's not caused by the sin of others. People get struck by lightning. And there are no simple answers. If you've ever tried to study the book of Job, you'll know that it's not a simple book. It's not an easy read. Uh, the short narrative sections at the beginning and end are quite straightforward. But in between these two sections, there are 40 chapters of complex poetry written in Hebrew, difficult to translate, let alone to understand. And we're going to focus this morning on chapter 19, which is right in the middle of, of that great series of poems. Chapter 19 is actually one of the easiest sections, but I want us to spend a few minutes to try and put it in the context. So, in a nutshell, the book is a story of a good and 
wealthy man who is suddenly afflicted by the loss of all his material possessions, all his family, apart from his wife, and then his health. And he wrestles with the question of why this is happening to him. And this wrestling with that question is presented in the form of a dialogue between Job and his so-called friends who seek to comfort him, but in practice speak falsely about God. And eventually Job answers God, but he doesn't answer his questions. God answers him with another series of questions, not with answers to the questions that Job's been wrestling. But Job is satisfied with God's answer, and eventually he's restored by God to the prosperity that he once enjoyed, or double the prosperity he once enjoyed. That's the story in a nutshell. And it's easy to seek simple answers to this question, why do innocent people suffer, uh, in the story of Job, uh, but I don't believe they're there. For example, you could look at the narrative in the first couple of chapters and come up with a theory that, uh, that this world is governed by a sort of cosmic conflict between spiritual beings. Beings, something like this, a conflict between God and Satan, and humans are just pawns in that, that, that game, pawns in that conflict. And inevitably, there's going to be suffering as a result of the fallout from this cosmic battle. But fortunately for us, Jesus has won the victory in this war. Although there are still little battles and skirmishes as the devil's troops are defeated, the final victory is assured and will be enjoyed by Jesus' followers in heaven. And there is a lot of truth in that. But I don't think it's a valid interpretation of the text of the book of Job. If we read the first two chapters carefully, it is God who is in control. It's God who initiates the dialogue with Satan, or you could translate Satan there as the opposer, probably a better translation. It's God who says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God initiates the conversation, and it's God who sets strict limits on the actions of Satan. In fact, God says to Satan after Job's initial affliction, he, that's Job, still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. God is in control, and Satan is not an equal and opposite spiritual force. And Christians believe, on the basis of what we read in the Bible, and what's been revealed to us, that God is the creator, and everything else is his creation. There's a line, if you like. God, Father, Son, and Spirit are one side of that line, and everything else is his creation. Animals, and humans, and angels, and demons, and Satan. We're not talking about a cosmic battle between two gods. God is in control. And there are also some other hints of what's going on in this book, and why this is happening to Job, but they're not really developed in this story. We're still left with a question of why. For example, one, one avenue was, uh, is this. It talks to us about the whole aspect of love. When Satan responds to God, when he points out what a good person Job is, oh, Satan says to God, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the works of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. In other words, Satan says to God, no wonder Job is blameless and loves you, God. You've bribed him. Job only loves you because he knows he'll be rewarded. Is that the truth? If God only always operates on the principle of just compensation, if we always get ice cream, if we eat our vegetables, where does that leave our love of God? How do we know that we love God rather than it just being our self-interest, that God will look after us? But we believe, don't we, that pure love is, is much more than that. It's more than self-seeking. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in that famous passage, which is often read at weddings from 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Love is not just selfishness. We celebrate love, don't we, as something that rises above self-interest. True love does not depend on rewards. It's constant. It's unconditional. And that's, that's reflected in their literature. Shakespeare, he writes this in one of his sonnets, Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Love is constant. If love was just based on getting rewards for it, then how would we know that we really love God? Well, we're going to get to chapter 19. But I I first want to summarize this dialogue with Job's three friends that occupies chapters 3 to 27. And I came across this illustration. I think it's helpful. It's in the form of a triangle. 
So imagine a triangle, and at one apex you've got a theory that God is just, and on another corner you've got Job is innocent, he's called blameless, and then on the third corner God's policy is just compensation. That's the way he runs the world, that you always get rewarded for doing good. And the question is, can we hold these three things together? Can all three be true? And Job's so, so cool friends say God is just and his policy is always just compensation. And therefore, Job, you must have done something wrong. That corner doesn't work. So one of these friends, Eliphaz, says to him, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God, they perish. Or another one, Bildad, says to him, Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Job, you must have done something wrong. God is just and always rewards good people. Therefore, you've done something wrong, Job. And if you repent of your wrong, God will restore you. But on the other hand, if you read Job's responses, he says, no, I am innocent. So he questions whether God is just, whether God is righteous. So Job says this in reply to his friend, God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. God has turned me over to the ungodly and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. My face is red with weeping. Dark shadows ring my eyes. Yet my, yet my hands have been free of violence and my prayer is pure. I'm innocent. Job says, not perfect, he never claims to be perfect, but Job said, I don't deserve what's happening to me. He says this, as long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit you are right, you are in the right, till I die. I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. Job is innocent, he claims. Not perfect, but he doesn't deserve what's happened to him. Therefore, if God operates a policy of just compensation, God's not operating with justice. Who is right? Well, not his friends, because at the end of the book, we read this. After the Lord has said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. That's God's verdict. And Job comes to appreciate, I think, in this book, that God is just, but that doesn't mean that he always has to run the world according to a policy of just compensation. We don't always get ice cream if we eat vegetables. The world that God has to sustain is much bigger, much more complex than that, much more complex than Job or we can imagine. God is just. And Job was blameless, but that doesn't mean that bad stuff will not sometimes happen to good people. And often we won't be able to understand why. Job is never given the reason why. He's never let into the what we, the reader, are let into in those narrative in the first two chapters. Job is not aware of that. But like Job, we need to trust that God has a plan and that he knows best. And that in the end, our future glory will far outweigh anything that we might suffer in the present. We need to trust God. And that's the context with which we read chapter 19. And in it, I think we see examples of the heights and depths of Job's journey. If we read through the, the book, and I say it's a hard read, but it's worth the effort. If we read through it, we see that Job is on an emotional roller coaster. Often he's crushed by his pain and suffering, and he doubts, has doubts about God's love. God's justice, but sometimes he rises out of the despair, out of those doubts, and is strong and certain. And isn't that exp our experience too, when we go through difficulties and pain and suffering? It's a bit of a roller coaster. We have periods of depression, periods where we feel stronger. We see both the troughs and the peaks in chapter 19. So in chapter 19, firstly, he protests against his so-called friends. How long will you torment me? And crush me with words. 
10 times. That's a little bit of an exaggeration because we've only got twice each, but the friends recorded in the book. 10 times you, now you have reproached me. Shamelessly, you attack me. If it is true that I've gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. Have pity on me, friends, my, my friends. Have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? We read at the end of chapter 2, the first thing that Job's friends did when they heard misfortune was to come and sit with him silently for seven days and seven nights. And actually, it has been suggested to me that this was the only good thing that friend, Job's friends did, to sit with him in silence. And I think sometimes when their friends are suffering, that is the best thing we can do, just to get alongside them and to be silent. And the book of Job is a warning against presenting a false picture of God when we seek to comfort friends who are suffering. It's a warning against not speaking truth about God. Because we read, don't we, that God was angry with these three friends. And I think that he'll be angry with us if we fail to speak truth about God. That's why we gather together to study his word on a, on, on a Sunday morning, in their growth groups and in their personal study of the Bible, so that we can learn to speak the truth about God, and therefore that we'll be useful to our friends when they're, they're suffering. It's important. And when, when Job describes his uh, suffering, it's not the physical pain that he focuses on, though undoubtedly he was suffering physical pain, but he focuses on the psychological, the mental and the emotional pain, the rejection by his friends, the alienation from his wife and family. He has alienated my family from me. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have gone away. My closest friends have forgotten me. My guests and my female servants count me a foreigner. They look on me as a stranger. I summon my servant, but he does not answer. Though I beg him with my own mouth, my breath is offensive to my wife. I'm loathsome to my own family. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I have loved turn against me. That's a dreadful picture, isn't it? Joe feeling such isolation because no one's there to support him. Uh, Val and I have recently been at a convention in Keswick. There was a series of seminars with uh, Professor John Wyatt, who's a medic, who's uh, uh, authored a number of books on on things like euthanasia, and uh, and this these were entitled the final lap talking about the last years of life. So Val and I, being of the age we are, <laughs> thought we ought to go along to these. Um, and they were great. Um, you can get on the website uh, and worth, well worth um, looking these up. Um, but one thing he said was that uh, when he talked about um, approaching death, he said that, that a great number of people have a great fear of dying, um, but it's not just the physical pain, it's the psychological and emotional and mental pain. A medical practice can cope with the physical pain, but when friends are suffer, when friends are approaching uh, the end of their lives, we need to support and help them with these other forms of pain, with the psychological and emotional and spiritual pain. That's what friends and family are for. And poor Job missed out on that. But Job's main protest is against God. He writes this, God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Though I cry violence, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He has blocked my path, so I cannot pass. He has shrouded my paths in darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He up uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. That all sounds a bit strong for us, doesn't it? But remember, the verdict of the author of this book is that Job has spoken the truth about God. There's no censure of Job for saying that he, what he said. Job protested and shouted at God. And there's no suggestion that he shouldn't have done it. It's okay to protest against God. It's okay even to shout against God. It's okay to ask, why is this happening to me? Because it is an expression of faith. It is an expression that we trust that God is there and he's listening. If this world was just a, a random collection of atoms, if it was just purely 
a consequence of a big bang that happened 13 and a half billion years ago and nothing more than that. If everything happens by chance, then of course bad stuff will happen to good people. And it's pointless asking the question why. That's just the way the world is. But we do ask why because we believe it isn't just a question of chance. I love this poem, which I've quoted before by Steve Turmer, Chance. If chance be the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow of the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills 10, troops on rampage, whites go looting, bomb blast school, it is but the sound of man worshipping his maker. Whenever we put the question, why is there pain and suffering? It's an expression of faith that there is some meaning and purpose in this world. It's not just a product of random chance. And the message of the Bible, I think, is that God wants us to protest, to call out to him, because he's a loving and faithful Heavenly Father who does care about us, even when we can't understand what's happening, even when it all appears so wrong. He does want us to call out to him. Job cries out to God to answer him. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. Job cries out. If only I could go and, and discuss with God. If only we could work it out together. And in this vein of, of preparing his case so that he can confront God like a barrister in a courtroom, Job wants his words indelibly recorded forever. He wants to set them down. So he says, oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I think those are ironic, aren't they? The words that Job wanted to be recorded are being read and studied nearly 3,000 years after they were first recorded. And even if not many people actually get as far as chapter 19 in the book of Job, millions of people every year will listen to Handel's Messiah. And these next words uh, are incorporated in, into Handel's great music. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Simply protesting to God is a cry of faith. But Job goes much further, doesn't he, with this statement, I know that my Redeemer lives. And we who live after the time of Jesus rightly see this as an incredible foresight into the time when God would take the initiative. God would provide one who would bridge that gap between God and man, a redeemer who would bring together almighty God with imperfect humanity, a redeemer who would buy us back out of slavery and pay the price for the, for the consequence of our sins and restore us to that relationship with God that we were designed for one who will return to earth, one who we will see and be with in heaven. It's an incredible foresight. But I don't believe that the author intended this passage to be meaningless for the few hundred years until Jesus came. Surely not. And surely we could say that for other parts of the Old Testament. Yes, we look back through the, uh, through, in the light of Jesus, but it did mean something to those who, were, who it was written to at the time. So what would the first readers, the pre-Christian readers, have understood by this cry of faith, I know my Redeemer lives? What would they have understood by redeemer? Well, the word that's used in, in the original is the word goel, which is the word used in the Old Testament for a kinsman redeemer. If a Jewish family got into financial trouble, there was no benefit system, no social services, no food bank down the road. So often the, the choice uh, it was a stark choice. Often the choice was either to starve to death or to sell themselves into slavery. And if they sold themselves into slavery, there was an obligation on some someone from the wider family to try and act as their redeemer, to buy them back out of slavery and get them back on their feet again, to redeem them. So they, they would have associated the word with that, someone who would buy them back out of slavery. That's one thing that would have come to mind. But also they recognize God as their redeemer, particularly in the story of Exodus, is that great example of redemption in the Old Testament, the delivery of the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. So God says, 
to Moses in Exodus chapter 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. And I think that's interesting, because whereas sometimes we think of being redeemed in purely spiritual terms, of being delivered from a spiritual separation from God, uh, which is the consequence of their sin, the people to whom it was written would have had a much wider concept of redemption. Not just a spiritual deliverance, but affecting all aspects of life, the physical, the economic, and the social, as well as the spiritual. And that's the one who Job puts his faith in, his trust in, and the one who we can put our faith in. One who will deliver us spiritually when we call out to him, but one who is also will one day deliver us from any pain and suffering and for all our economic and social problems. One who will deliver us when we live with God himself, and in those great words at the end of our Bible, God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's the Redeemer we put our trust in. And we who live after the coming of Jesus have a much clearer revelation than Job did. We have a Redeemer, Jesus, who lived and died for us who went willingly to the cross so that we can be forgiven and brought back into relationship with God our Father. I know that my Redeemer lives.